Let's prepare our hearts to worship. Good morning, church, wherever you are this morning. Let's give the Lord our full attention. Praise Him for paying our debt, setting us free. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch Him. about what he's done for us. We didn't deserve it, yet he loved us enough. One day we'll stand before him. And when before the start off this morning. All right. Y'all doing good this morning? Are you warm? Very much. Well, that's a good sign right now. 
That is a good sign. Hey, kids, are y'all excited about the potential for snow? Uh-uh. I heard my child. Uh-uh. That's my child. <laughs> the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Mm-mm. I, it looks pretty on TV. It looks pretty in other places. But Miss Scarlett does not like the cold weather. <laughs> y'all know that, right, Brother Aaron? They like to pick on me in the office because it can be 75 in the office and I still have my heater going. So, I don't know. Crazy life. But I am excited you are here with us. Hey, if you're joining us online, we're so glad. Hey, kids, if you came in, I hope you got your Swartz Kids Worship Guide. It'll help you follow through in worship. And so, parents, we want to let you know those are available also. They're at each of the entrances. And make sure you have those. Well, I brought a very expensive item with me today to teach you something. Does anybody know what this is? It's a tin can. It used to hold something that's not there anymore. It's in my refrigerator for later. But this tin can reminds me of a game we used to play. We really didn't play it a whole lot, but it was called Kick the Can. It's kind of like hide and go seek. So this is how you play Kick the Can if you've never played. Somebody, everybody gets together, somebody gets chosen as it. It closes their eyes, stands by the tin can, and they count to 50 while everybody else goes and hides. Well, when they get to 50, they go and they find, they try and find someone that is hidden. And when you get found, your job is to run all the way back to the tin can and try and kick the tin can over before you get tagged. Does it sound like fun? Pretty fun, huh? And you can play it with anything, like a plastic Coke bottle, you could play it with a Coke can, but we sometimes would grab one of Mama's tin cans that she maybe had used and we would use it, but other times we just played hide and go seek because that's really what it is, right? Or I guess I should say hide and seek. We always said hide and go seek, but um, it was just like a game of hide and seek. I want to ask you a question. Do you think anybody's ever played hide and seek with God? Yes. Do you remember the very first people God created, Adam and Eve, and he had given them one rule. Don't eat the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden and of course they ate it and they were ashamed and they heard God walking in the garden and what did they do they hid because they were ashamed they knew they had disappointed God they had broken his rules that's what we call sin and so they hid did God find them he did he knew exactly where they were what about the story of Jonah you're gonna hear a lot about that today about the story of Jonah. I love the story of Jonah. And as a child, it's probably one that sticks out in my mind the most about something that God taught me that was very important from that story. And it's one I want to teach you today. So we know the story of Jonah. Jonah was a man that loved God. He was a prophet. And he was excited about what God was doing. But then God gave him a job to do. And was he excited about it? No, he was supposed to go to Nineveh and tell the people there about God so that they could turn away from living their way and turn to the one true God. It's called repenting of their sin. Sin's anything we think, say, or do that makes God sad, right? And we're all sinners. Well, the Ninevites, in Jonah's mind, they were the chief sinners. And he thought, God, you can send me anywhere, but don't send me to Nineveh. And so instead of doing what God told him to do, and knowing that God was going to be with him, what did he do? He ran away. He tried to hide. Do y'all remember where he found himself hiding? In the belly of a great fish, right? That is not where I want to end up. Any of you kind of like being in the belly of a fish? Not me. I don't like smelling the fish on the outside, so I can't imagine what it'd be like on the inside, right? So that's where he found himself. Did God know exactly where Jonah was? Did God reach Jonah in the middle of that belly of that fish? He sure did. And then there's another story about a shepherd boy that God called to be the king of Israel when he was just a young boy. And in Acts chapter 13, we read that he was chosen because he was a man after God's own heart. His name was David. And God used him in a mighty way to lead his people. But guess what? David's just like you and me. And he messed up. And there were a lot of times that David probably wanted to hide from God. But he knew 
There's no hiding from God. Listen to what David wrote in Psalm 139. He says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it. Lord, you have encircled me. You have placed your hand on me. This wondrous knowledge is beyond me. It is lofty. I am unable to reach it. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I fly on the wings of the dawn and settle down on the western horizon, even there, your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be night. David knew we cannot hide from God. There's nowhere that his presence is not. He is present everywhere. So there's nowhere that we can hide from God. And that was something that was very important for me to remember and to learn as a child, was that no matter where I went, God was always with me. Now when we look at Adam and Eve and we look at Jonah, we see they were hiding because they were ashamed of their sin. Because they knew that that separated them from a God who loved them and wanted to bless them. So if we can't hide from God, why would we even want to when we realize he's our creator? He gave us life because he loves us. And when he's seeking us, which is always, it's because he wants to bless us. So we cannot hide from God. He is big and he's wonderful and he loves us. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. And we thank you that you are a big God, bigger than our minds can even comprehend. God, we thank you that there's nowhere we can go to hide from your presence, that you are with us everywhere we are. And so God, we thank you that you are here with us now, that you're with us in our homes, if we're watching online. God, that you um, go with us everywhere we go. We love you. We thank you that you seek us and you desire a relationship with us. God, be glorified in us today. We want to worship you, our great God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and continue to sing. together every desire 
nothing is better than you. Can you think of any place in your life that seems like a grave and seems like a dark place that either in the past or maybe in the present or looming ahead in the future, but this is what God does. He turns our beauty into ashes or ashes into beauty and he turns our graves into something beautiful that glorify him that is full of life and springing forth uh, with beauty. And we just want to sing to that promise and that truth of his nature and what he does for us. We want to sing that again, that even though it seems like morning right now. He's going to turn it into a celebration of dancing. So let's sing that again. You turn morning.
dead rose from their tombs and the angel stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born in the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall who we are and who we are in you and who you are to us and thank you for being here amongst us and your spirit moving we pray that continues as we open up your word it's in jesus name we pray these things amen Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing today? Wonderful, wonderful. I'm so glad you're here. I wonder, are there any runners in here today? Runners? Walkers? <laughs> are there any walkers in here today? Uh, uh, when I think about running, I think about if I have to have motivation. I don't know about you. I will run if a big dog's coming after me. Uh, and it has to be a pretty big dog at that. Otherwise, I'm going to take my chance with a stick, right? But... Uh, I want to talk to you just a, a moment about an article that Christine Luff, she's an avid uh, runner and fitness enthusiast, wrote about 11 reasons to start running. So maybe if you haven't started running, uh, these 11 reasons will motivate you to begin running. She said, first of all, running improves your health. And uh, she said uh, that running, you can lose weight from running. You can meet new people because obviously there's all kinds of running clubs and there's all kinds of routines that people find that, that they connect with other people. You can run for a cause. There's multiple uh, 5Ks that are out there and 10Ks and then the, the real triathlete type people that many of them are running for very good causes and raising money. And uh, she says that running is good for your memory. And that was important to me because there's a lot of things the older I get, I can't remember. Uh, even my kids' names at times, I, I know who they are. I know their birthdays. But in the heat of the moment, I have to go through all five names sometime to figure out who they are. He says you can, she says you can train for a specific goal. Maybe there's something that, that you're trying to, to uh, work on in your life. That's a good reason. Running improves your energy level. She says running will help you feel good about yourself. Running is versatile and inexpensive, and uh, you'll be a part of a community. There's a community of people that, that make up the running community, and uh, running can help you with stress relief. Right now, the number one diet of 2021, we already have it, is the running diet. So uh, maybe for, for some of you, that just motivated you to get out there and put on your running shoes and to take off and uh, to call the paramedics. But today, I want to talk to you about a different kind of running. 
I want to talk to you about running from God. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be in a new series in the book of Jonah. So take out your Bibles and turn with me to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1, and we do uh, welcome those of you that are watching online. We're so glad that you're with us. Please take your Bible and join us as well as we go and see what God has to say through us through this book in this series called The Runaway. Will you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? I'm so glad that you're here and uh, excited about what he's going to show us this morning. It says in Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid a fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they hurled the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner parts of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. They said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What, what is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do with you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them therefore they called out to the Lord O Lord let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you O Lord have done as it pleased you so they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives today through the wonderful music that we've sung, the prayers we've prayed, and now the reading of your word. Would you just do a work in us today to draw us closer to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. You can be seated. The bottom line that I wanted you to get today, if you're taking notes, is don't try to outrun God's purpose for your life. Don't try to outrun God's purpose for your life. Two things that leap out from this uh, passage that we just read is, first, your running is rebellion. When you and I try to run from God's purpose for our life, what we're actually doing is we're rebelling against God. It's our rebellion towards Him. We, we find here that Jonah wanted out of God's presence. In fact, it says it twice in the first three verses that he wanted to get away from God. Why? Because God had told him to go to Nineveh, the great city that was evil. So God knew exactly what he was calling Jonah to. It was not a surprise to God. In fact, God even let him know, I know it's a great city, and I know it's a very evil city, but I want you to go there. So in in response to God, 
basically what Jonah does, and you've heard the story before, he goes in the opposite direction. He goes down to Joppa, and he wants to go to Tarshish, and he pays a fare, which would be a mighty hefty fee. It probably cost him everything he owned to get on that boat to go in the opposite direction. It was a, it was a long journey in the wrong way. So Jonah wanted out of God's presence. And Jonah thought going to Tarshish would change God's mind. Uh, he, he thought, well, hey, if I, maybe if I go the opposite direction, he'll say, well, I can't call Jonah because now he's so far away from Nineveh. So I'm going to have to go find somebody else, which Jonah was fine with, to say, hey, maybe, maybe, I mean, there's a lot of people in the world that could go and speak to these people if that's really what God wants uh, to happen. But Jonah had a real problem with the evil in that city, and he's thinking, why would you send me to that kind of assignment. Jonah's rebellion, though, it impacted others. When you look at verses 4 through 6, this great tempest had come upon the sea. It's like a, it was so great, and you hear tempestuous, that word means it's like a mighty cyclone upon the sea is happening. Now, what you need to understand is these sailors were used to being on the sea. And they were used to storms on the sea. They were used to hurricane weather, but this was different. And in fact, because of Jonah's rebellion, they were having to throw their cargo off. Well, the cargo was what they were really making money on. They were headed from Joppa to Tarshish for their business. So they're losing business. They're having to throw things off while he's down in the, in the cabin sleeping. Well, Jonah's rebellion impacted them in a great way. In fact, they thought they were all going to lose their lives. They were already losing their business. And, and the, the storm was so bad, and it had them so afraid that they weren't even thinking about that anymore. They were just trying to survive. But he's on a boat with men who don't even know who the real God is. He, you know, the captain wakes him up and says, Hey, pray to whatever God you pray to, and maybe your God and our God, somebody's God, maybe somebody will pray to somebody, and maybe somebody will hear us. So he's filled with fear, and he says, Maybe, maybe, just maybe, your God will make a difference. Well, you know, last week we talked about how Jesus said, that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And, and I asked the question, why is there a worker problem? Well, it's, it's because of what we learn in Luke chapter 9. It's excuses. We all make excuses. Maybe at a different season in my life, or maybe when things get better, or, or when the pandemic's over, or, or when my whatever, fill in the blank. And that's exactly what's happening here with Jonah. He's making an excuse, and while he's making an excuse, he's missing the purpose of God for his life, but you shouldn't ever try to outrun God's purpose for your life because your running is rebellion. But also, your repentance is redemptive. Your repentance is redemptive. When we go down from verse 7 and following, you find that Jonah came clean about his running. And uh, they, they cast lots. And they said, somebody, this, this is different from the storms that we normally see. So somebody's done something wrong, and we're going to cast lots, and it fell to Jonah. And they said, who are you? Why are you here? What, when, where, why? All of those things. And he says, I, I want to know who you are and what you have done to put us in this kind of situation. And he says, well, I'm a Hebrew. And my God is the God of the sea and the dry land. And he said it with such conviction that they knew, oh my goodness, your God must be the God then. Because he has done something here that we haven't seen before. And we're all going to die because of your stupidity and your rebellion. And in that moment, Jonah took responsibility for his rebellion and he said, throw me over the side. Now, these guys, they, they didn't want to do that because they didn't want his blood on their hands. So they, they thought, well, surely there's a different way. So here's lost men that are dealing with a rebellious follower of God. And now they start praying to the God of the universe, our God. And they say, oh, God, 
Please don't put this man's blood on our hands. Please allow it to be a different way so that we aren't responsible for his choices. But the men learned a valuable lesson. It says in verses 13 through 16 that they started to to try to row harder. There's got to be a different way. And Jonah's like, no, the, the storm is the storm because of my sin. It's because of my sin that this storm has gotten out of control. In fact, the further I try to get away from the presence of God, the bigger the storm gets. So you have to throw me into the storm. Wow. So they figure out that this is not going to work. This, this plan that they had to try to get to dry land, it's, it's not working. In fact, the storm grew stronger. They thought it was as strong as it could get, but it wasn't. The men learned a valuable lesson. But the interesting thing was they threw Jonah into the storm, into the sea. And everything became calm. And from Jonah's rebellion, from the presence of God, he found the presence of God in the middle of a storm. But not only did he, but the men that were about to lose their lives because of his rebellion found God in the midst of the storm. And this passage where we stop today ends with them making sacrifices and commitments to the one true God. Because of his repentance, it redeemed not only his path, but the path of those that were around him that were about to lose their lives for his rebellion. You see, repentance is redemptive. But you know, uh, the, the real issue for him, for us, is this question, who's in control? Who's really in control? And we like to use verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, the way that we want to use the verse. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Well, we love those kind of verses, don't we? But do you realize who's saying that? It's Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a nickname, the weeping prophet. You want to know why he was called the weeping prophet? Because much like many preachers all across the world, he had people that he preached to and he preached to and he preached to and it came to the time of invitation and nobody moved. Oh, and it broke his heart. And he'd go to the next town and he'd preach and he'd preach and he'd preach and they would not listen and nobody moved. So they called him the weeping prophet because his job was to go and tell, but he could not cause the people to move. But in Jeremiah 29, 11, he tells the people that God said, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give a hope in the future. So the way we view that verse a lot of times is when I'm doing the things that I like to do that are my dreams, that are my, my goals in life, God wants me to do that because that prospers me and it gives me hope. And, and it's, it's what I, I believe is best for me, so that's what I do. But that's not what the verse says. The verse says that God knows the plan. So if you and I are going to know the purpose of God for our, for our lives, we have to get to know the God that knows the plan. But so many people love to quote verses without thinking about who's saying what is being said. How can we know the purpose of God for our lives if we don't spend time with the God of the universe? How can you and I, we, another one, a great one, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Boy, we love that one, but let's put it in context. Paul had just said, I've been beaten and I've been without food, and I've had food. Oh, whoa, oh, we don't, we don't, I've never heard anybody quote that part that's right before that. He's saying, I can do all things. How? Because he's had it when it's good, and he's had it when it's bad, and he's able to do all things through Christ. Why? Because he is leaning on Christ in all of his circumstances, good or bad. So the question is, who is really in control? God is. 
Your running is rebellion, but your repentance is redemptive. So I have a question for you today. Are you running from God? Is there an area of your life, or maybe just with your life, are you running from God? You see, the way you know that is if you're not running towards Him, you're running from Him. Now, I didn't understand that until somebody challenged me with that. One of my mentors in the faith, he said, you know, to to do nothing with your spiritual life, to not wake up and to spend time in God's Word, to not spend any time in prayer, but to go about the work of the Lord without pursuing God, you're actually not going in the direction of God. You're going in your direction because you're not investing the time to get to know the one who has the plan. So he says we're never really standing still in our faith. We're going one way or the other. And he said to not pursue him is to fly from him. Boy, that really challenged me. Are you running from God? Because you see, Jonah, we can learn from Jonah that in the first three verses, it said he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Fleeing from the presence of the Lord. But what did he find out? Oh, well, it doesn't. You want to go to Tarshish? I'll go with you. How about a little storm on the way? And we've all walked through those times in our life, haven't we? Where we're going, why is all this happening to me? But we still don't pursue the God of the universe. Instead, we, we try to hang on in the boat, hoping that the storm will subside. God calls us to repent. Because the choices we make affect everyone around us. Think about all the people in your boat. All the people in your boat are the people that are affected by every choice you make, good or bad. I got a lot of people in my boat. And it's multiplying. And it's going to multiply more. And more. In fact, I'm thinking about starting a Christmas fund for my grandkids right now because I'm doing the math. I'm just thinking... uh, Let's start them out low. I mean, some of y'all probably did that. Let's just start out with a $5 gift card to something, right? Don't try to outrun God's purpose for your life. Job learned that. In Job 42.2, it says, I know you can do all things. We know what happened to Job. He lost everything. And he had some good friends that loved to encourage him, right? I mean, for chapter after chapter, they're saying, you did something wrong. You need to repent. He said, I know you can do all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Psalm 138.8 says, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Proverbs 16.4 says, the Lord made everything for its purpose. Now that's important because when you think about the Lord making everything for its purpose, that, that lets us know that sometimes when we're trying to do things that aren't our purpose, that's why it doesn't click right. Maybe it was for someone else. And then in Romans 8, 28 and 29, it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son now that's that's very profound because what that's saying is God's purpose for you is that you would be conformed to be more like Jesus every day but the way he fulfills that purpose in you is different from the way he fulfills it in me And for you to become more like Christ, for me to become more like Christ, it's not always going to be roses. For us to become conformed to the image of His Son, we're going to have to be crucified in our lives. We're going to lose some things and lose some people in our lives. We're going to have to say no to some things. And then there's going to be days that we are greatly blessed. 
Then there's days that we have of sorrow. And, and then when you view it through the eyes of Jesus and you're fulfilling your purpose, even if your purpose, your assignment is a Nineveh assignment and you think there is no way I'm going into that evil place to do what God called me to do, you can say, uh, or maybe that's exactly where I need to go for God to make me more like Jesus. So you may be walking through things right now and you see it as God has left you. Listen to me. You see it as God has left you because of what you're going through. I declare to you today, you're going through it because that's the only way he sees that he can make you more like him. He wants to make you more like him. So he's going to chisel, 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 chisel. But you say, is there ever light at the end of the tunnel? Well, absolutely. There's resurrection power in him. It's not always going to be this way, but we go through seasons of great chiseling, don't we? Here's what we know. Running is rebellion, but repentance of our sin and repentance of running from God is redemptive. So the question is, are you running in the wrong direction? You know, sometimes we think that our way is best, but maybe we're headed in the wrong direction. Sometimes the storms of our life, listen, that storm was huge. And we would say, oh, that's scary and it's fearful, but look what came out of that storm. Think about it. Think about this story. What came out of the storm? Jonah turned back to the purpose of God. And we'll talk about that more next week. I don't want to give it all away. But Jonah turned back to the purpose of God, and a group of sailors got it right. They were able to see that the God of Jonah was the God above all gods. So you may say, oh, it's just horrible. That storm was terrible, and you should have been there. And I, I thought we were all going to die, and our business went down, and all of this stuff, but we throw this guy into the sea and everything went calm. Sometimes a storm is just to test your trust, to test your faith, to test your courage, to test your resolve for God's purpose for your life. And 1 John 1, 9 is a great verse for us to hang on to. It says, if we confess our sin, because let's just be honest, all of us in here are runners. Nobody wanted to raise your hand that you, you were a runner at the beginning, but let's just be honest. Spiritually, we're all runners. There are days God tells us to do something, and we just don't do it. That's running from God. And the quicker we're honest about the things we're running from, the, the better opportunity there is for us to change and experience His redemption. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we confess our sins, he forgives us and he cleanses us. Now that's awesome. Because to forgive is one thing. You and I, we can do that, right? We, we, can, we can forgive people, but that second part is huge. Okay? Because that second part is erase it. And there's something in us that likes to still hold on to it, right? Well, I've forgiven, but... Well, then we haven't forgiven. <laughs> but in a sentence, he erases everything we just said. So to cleanse is to say, I, it's like it never happened. Is that not awesome? That when you confess your sin and when I confess my sin, God is just to forgive it. And to cleanse it, to wipe it away. Wow. God's purpose for your life and for my life begins when we stop running and we seek redemption through Jesus Christ. Father, today I pray all across this room that, Lord, we would seek redemption from you. Lord, like Jonah, we run. And, Lord, sometimes the, the assignment's just, it, it, it's just a huge storm. And it seems like the more we try to get out of it in our own power, the storm just gets larger and larger and larger until we surrender.
And that's what you want us to do, to do like Jonah and just surrender and just jump into the midst of the storm. To embrace it for all that it can teach us. So Lord, I pray today that that we would stop running from you and run towards you. Lord, I pray if there's anyone in this room or anyone watching online that, that is caught in sin, trying to run from the presence of God, that we would learn from Jonah that you're right where we are. You know what's going on. You're in the midst of the storm. And your goal is that we would hand over control to you and stop trying to control our own lives. Lord, thank you that we cannot outrun your purpose for us. Thank you that you run after us. Thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for us. And thank you that that, that it's good. But Lord, help us to see that sometimes the good, um, to become great, it requires sacrifice. For us to become more like Jesus, we, we can't just be Jesus who healed and Jesus who, who loved. We have to be Jesus who suffered. So Lord, I don't know where my friend is today that's listening to this sermon, but I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that we'll confess and we'll find you forgiving us and cleansing us. I pray for the friend that's listening that's never put their faith and trust in you. They've been like the sailors on the boat that just says, call out to whatever you call out to. Do your best. Maybe today is the day that they confess that Jesus is Lord of their life. Lord, call people to your salvation. Call people to your truth, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, we have ministers here at the front. The altar is open for you. If, if there's a decision upon your heart, you want to make Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord, you need His salvation. You need Him to, to capture you out of your storm. Won't you come? He says, if you confess, I will forgive you and I will cleanse you from everything. And I will put you on a path to be more like me. Is today the day of your salvation? Maybe you're here and you've made a commitment to Christ, but you need a church home. Don't try to go into the storm alone, my friend. It's never intended to be that way. You need brothers and sisters who will love you and encourage you. You come. Let one of us know that you'd like to know more about becoming a part of our church family. Maybe you just need to come to the altar and pray for a Jonah that you know that's running. You know who they are, and that's between you and the Lord. But maybe you just need to come and through the power of prayer, pray, oh God, whoever your Jonah is, the person that you know is running from God, that you love and you want them to see Jesus and you want them to be redeemed and you want them to stop running. Maybe maybe we need to be the church that gets on our knees at the altar and calls the Jonahs home. Whatever the Spirit leads you to do, let's follow him. Will you stand with me? Carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go, and I see it now. Laying it down, and I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 oh,
had a plan from the start your son for redemption the prize for my heart and I don't have a context for that kind of love I don't understand I can't comprehend all I know is I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. I hope you're going to stay for Connect Groups. If you have a decision upon your heart or a prayer need, please take time to fill out the Connect Card portion of your bulletin. and You can turn it up in up here at the offering plates, and we'll be happy to get those and pray for you and assist you in anything that you, you write in on that Connect Card. And if you're online, you can do that by, by hitting the blue button on our website, swartzfbc.org. We would love for you to connect with us that way. And, and we'll follow up with you uh, from, from that information that you give us. Jay, why don't you come and uh, close us out as we finish today. Thank you so much for being here. Also, Rebecca Young kind of heads up our greeter ministry. We need some help, guys, if, you have, uh, if you'd be willing to work at some of the doors, especially for the second service. We want to make sure people feel welcome when they come in and we open the door and we smile the best we can under our mask. And, uh, and let them know we're glad that they're, they're joining us today. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your blessings today. Thank you for an opportunity that we have just to come and, and to hear your word preached. Thank you for the message that we've heard from Brother Aaron. I pray, God, that we'd apply it to our hearts. Help us to be a runner towards you instead of away from you. And again, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and we pray in his name. Amen. <laughs>